One, two. Okay, we're back. I didn't expect that high energy that he kicked off the show with, but I think it's exactly what we needed, and I hope we can continue with the momentum throughout the show. So, uh, hello. Uh, this is Access All Areas. This is our seminar that we host every other month. Uh, and today's seminar is called how does music publishing work? So I assume everyone here is an artist or interested in being an artist or in some form of music business. And we have some expert panelists here who will be joining us to um, give us some insight on the music world of music publishing. We will have a little Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions and note it down, I'll be sure to get around to you at the end. But for now, we're just gonna have a chat and let's get settled in. Round of applause. Cool. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Anna Marie Descartes. I am a presenter, a DJ, and multi creative. And um, about seven years in the industry, formerly No Signal Radio, currently resident host for here and Soho House, and many other places. And um, to my left, we have Jacqueline Pelham Lee, who is the relationship manager at PRS for Music. Can we make some noise for Jacqueline, please? Then we have Susie Woodbridge, who is International A&R Manager at Warner Chapel. Thanks for Is it Chapel or Chappelle? Chapel. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the President, Kennedy Mensa, who is the founder of Back to the Music. Round of applause. <laughs> well, back, to back to the future. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm like kind of reading, kind of not. I'm so sorry. Back to the future music. Let's do a round of applause again. <laughs> yeah. okay. Sorry about that. Then we've got Dan Edu, who is the head of A&R at Phrase Differently. Round of applause. <laughs> then we have Uncle Ade, who is a lecturer and, um, at, university, at University of West London. And he does many other things, which we will get into in a little bit. Um, so a round of applause for Ade. And then lastly, we have Kesia Ellis, who is the founder of Rakodi Music. Round of applause. So a very diverse panel here. We're going to have an interesting conversation. Get your notepads ready or your notes app, whatever you've got. And um, prepare to learn and be inspired and educated. Okay, first, um, we're going to start with defining... Actually, I want you guys to talk about yourselves. Um, we'll start with you, Jacqueline. Tell us a little bit about your career, what you specialize in, et cetera, et cetera. So I started in the industry about 27 years ago. I started as a rapper, went on to become a music producer, songwriter, then worked as a manager, working in A&R. Actually, I consult at Dan's company, Phrase Differently. And for my sins, I'm now at the PRS for music because I'm all about the creatives, really. So that's me in a nutshell. Great. Um, I have only really been in music for like five or six years, but... Um, had a bit of an unconventional way in, like I'm not from London. It's going out a bit. Um, is this working? <laughs> um, anyway, I'm not from London, but um, I'm from like the countryside, like out in the sticks. And I kind of remember when I was doing like a career stay or something when I was like 15, I was like, I want to work for a record label, I think, just because I loved music. I was writing music myself. And they were like, hmm what A-levels are you doing? And I was like, well, like chemistry, biology, history. And they were like, you should do science. So basically, I went and did science at UCL in London. So like nothing to do with music. Um, but afterwards, I was like, I just can't get the music thing out of my head. So basically, I got a temp job at Warner Music in royalties. <laughs> I did that for like a year and a half and then just kind of dotted around the building, stayed in the building until I found myself in A&R about four years ago. So that's how I got to Warner Chapel. And I'm really happy I did it that way, actually, because I feel like not many people do <laughs> like go and do random degrees and then just find themselves in music. But I feel very lucky and very grateful, so. I did, I did politics and international relations <laughs> at Great. uni, and here we are today. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, perfect, here we are. There's more of us than we've realized. After Eric Effervescent, I, I don't know how he's supposed to be. No, his name is not Ever Wise. He got the wrong. He was born into the wrong family. He's Ever Fessen. <laughs> 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 
Okay, so my name is Kennedy Mensah, a.k.a. Mr. President. I came into the music industry, oh gosh. A long time ago. Every time I do this here, young people be like, oh! I was a DJ first, then I became a journalist, and in the year 1990. <laughs> I love that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> In, the, in 1990, I started writing a reggae column for the Voice newspaper. And that column ran for, for six years. It was called The Ragazine. So at that time, I gained a lot of knowledge in the reggae music idiom. So I was then approached by a, a music publishing company who had a lot of um, vintage reggae catalogs to come and consult. So that would, that's now, we're now in 1999-2000. So I came in as a consultant. That company was called Westbury Music. Um, and I was running there. I was looking after their reggae catalogs. So a lot of classic artists like John Hall, U Roy, um, Max Romeo, uh, Winston Riley. These names may not mean anything to you, but if I play some of the rhythms, they would definitely mean something to you. So I was there for eight years. And in 2008, so we're now in our 15th year, started a, a publishing concern called Back to, the Fu Back to the Future Music Limited. And uh, so I, I always say that the company, as a, as a publisher, you can publish anything. But I am reggae, so a lot of our clientele reflects me. So a lot of our, our clientele, about 80% of our clientele are all branches of the, of the reggae tree. So we have from classics like uh, uh, Dean Fraser, uh, King Jammies, who we deal with their, their neighboring rights. So our company split into neighboring rights and publishing. So we look after some of our clients as people who perform on a recording, and then the rest of our clients as writers. That's what publishing is. That is the, the we deal with writers. When we talk about, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping a gun a bit, but. When we talk writers in publishing, that is composer and author or lyric writer. So we deal with both sides of the, of the spectrum. So as I said, we're in our 15th year and Back to the Future is going from, from strength to strength. We have a couple clients in the building. One is, a, is, is one of our newest clients who um, came down from, from Gloucester. And we have a, a gentleman who's in the building. But if you haven't been networking, you wouldn't know who he is. But He's actually a, a Grammy Award winner, and he's on the way from, from Jamaica to, um, to America as we speak. But um, you do your networking, you might can get some tips on, on getting yourself a Grammy too. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Dan. Um, I've, I guess my musical journey, I'm basically a guy who's only good at two things, music and people. Um, so I somehow stumbled my way into working into music publishing as I grew up in a house where my mum tried to live her musical dreams through her first two children, because she grew up in Nigeria and she didn't really get to do music. So from when we were three, she just shoved us with our car master in church and said, let them figure it out. And, <laughs> and we've been figuring it out ever since. Um, started out because of church, playing a lot of instruments. And the natural, I guess, progression from that was trying to be a producer. And my brother started a youth. YouTube channel at the time with his friend um, called Link Up TV, which some of you might know. Um, and through that, I learned some business stuff because um, I didn't want to shoot videos. I just wanted to make music. Um, and through that, um, I went to uni, did psychology because I was good at people, um, and then realized I love chatting to people, but I don't want to be talking about their problems every day. <laughs> And I made the stupid decision of being a music publisher, and that's all I do anyway. <laughs> uh, um, and that, I've been uh, at Phrase Differently for nine plus years, and in music properly for about 15, and so far, so great. Hi, my name is Uncle Ade, also known as Ade. Um, I am a new university lecturer. I lecture at University of West London, Tar Yard Education, Community Music. Used to lecture at Westminster University, one of our 
fantastic graduates right here. Um, and I'm also the senior vice president for Groover, which is a new tech solution for the music industry. And I'm more about how music publishing should work. And I'll just put that there now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kisia Ellis. Um, so yeah, I grew up in a musical family um, and really witnessed my dad struggle with his IP. And along the journey, it was my solution. It became, that's what I need to sort out now. I need to fix that. How come everyone else can see the value in his music, but yet he's still not earning or, or understanding it? So growing up, I went along the way of going to college, uni, my lecturer. Um, and really just working my way through the majors, went from MTV to Universal Music to Sony, and then fell into an independent publishing company called Jack Russell that dealt with heavily reggae and dancehall music. We had the likes of Vibes Carter, Alkaline, all those type of people, and Robbie, and this goes on. Um, and really just felt that I've hit my ceiling there and started my own thing in July. So I have my own publishing company and I'm here. Amazing. Okay, so as you can see, it's you know, very a lot, a lot of talent, a lot of brain power here. Um, so it should be a very insightful conversation. And for anyone who doesn't know what music publishing uh, is, well, it's defined as the business of promoting and monetizing musical composition that ensures artists, songwriters, producers, etc., receive royalties for their work. We will deep dive into that a little bit further on as we get into the conversation. But I want to first start off, and anyone can jump in at any time. We do have one mic. I will be happy to give you my mic if you need to. Um, but do you think that uh, publishing is one of the most lucrative revenue streams for artists in today's market, in comparison to recorded music? I might get rid of this. So is, is publishing like the most lucrative way for artists to make music today? Or is there other means that we could be making some coins. As an artist, well, I always say this to everyone, right? If you're good at anything else, don't do music, right? But however, like the easiest why, way- wait, why? <laughs> why? I'll tell you why, because if, well, let me rephrase that. If you're doing music for money, then there are, a lot, there are many other ways to make money and many quicker ways to make money, all right? However, if you're doing it because, the reason why I use the word, because you're not good at anything else, it's the only thing you'll keep at doing it. Because with music, you have to keep going on, keep going on. It doesn't matter how talented you are. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. You just have to keep going, right? Because your, you being talented is like your entry pass. Everyone's talented, yeah. right? So you have to just keep going. Don't let money be your motivation. I think, I, I think music publishing is lucrative. However, as I say to JPL, if you're trying to get rich, don't be a publisher. If you're trying to feed your grandkids, be a publisher. Yeah. Because it's not money you're going to be able to live off really now. Because, the, because of how, like on they said, he's trying to figure out a way how music publishing should work. It's very broken at the moment. However, if you're trying to, like I, I would phrase that, if you're trying to be rich, don't be a publisher. If you're trying to create generational wealth that you will probably never see, mm -hmm. then consider being a... <laughs> 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 then consider being a publisher. As an artist, there are many other ways to make money quicker, like doing live shows, a record deal, I guess, um, and just being able to sell your merch and things like that. There are other ways outside of music publishing. Um, but like I said, it's more your money, it's more your pension or music money for your grandkids to live off. So the question is, is it, did you say is, it's the most lucrative or a lucrative? Is it a lucrative way to make money? Right now. Okay, so here's the thing. With, with any industry that you go into, and especially in this music industry, what you find is people always look at that guy or that lady, and they look at their success and think that that success should be their success too. So just how you might drive a, I don't know, you might drive a, a Skoda, say, and then you pull up next to me. Yeah, I'm old school. You might pull up next to me and I'm driving a Porsche. And you're upset that I'm driving a Porsche. But I earned more than you last year. So just because 
somebody's driving a Porsche does not mean that you should also be driving a Porsche. Just because Rihanna had a hit and sold five trillion records does not mean that you should also make a hit and sell five trillion records. If, however, you do have a hit and you, you sell that many recordings, then you should have a commensurate amount of royalties from that recording. It's all about whether or not you have a successful career, a hit. Now, in publishing, it's about the original. From you have contributed an original piece to a piece of successful music, then yes, you are due some, some, some money, and yes, it will be very lucrative. So a few years ago, when I started the company, young lady gets introduced to me, and... Um, She's like, right, so I've, I've got these four albums, um, but I've only released two singles, and I'm looking for a publisher. And I'm like, you've written, you've released two songs, you have four albums, when are these albums coming out? I don't know yet, but you know, I've got four albums. I'm like, well, it's too early for you to be speaking to a publisher. Because in publishing world, you have two songs. You can have 20 hit albums on your computer. If those albums have not been released, you are not a 20 album artist. So you cannot speak of those 20 albums. You could be the greatest songwriter on the planet. If your song has not been released and been heard and been loved by people, you, that song will never earn a penny. So it's all of, it can be the most a lucrative income stream, but it's all about you having a successful release first. So, and with a successful release, it doesn't just mean that you, you sold the most, especially in this day and age, it's about how many people played that recording. How many people have that on repeat? How, the numbers, it's a numbers game. If you have those numbers, then yes, it is a very lucrative situation. And also, it, oh, well, well, I know you're gonna go into it later, but a hit is a hit is a hit. So you'll have income from the radio, you'll have income from your streaming, and because people like that recording, now you've got companies looking to use that recording in what we call a synchronization. So it could be that you're going to hear it incidentally in EastEnders, say. You're going to hear it at a football ground. Yeah, I wasn't liking the scores from what I was hearing earlier, but yeah. You're going to hear that recording in an advert. Now, that's when it becomes really lucrative. And the more times a song is used in one of those streams is the more times it gets used again. And so you find that over time, especially like if you play like computer games and stuff, you find that you're hearing the same song in different games. Because the companies, when they hear what they, they all like to take from the, the, that same source. So when there's a hit, it becomes a hit. And it's a hit, and it's a hit. So that is now lucrative. So some of the, some of the clients in, in our company who, who earn the most, you would never have heard of. But you would have heard the original recording that they had recorded on that was a hit. So somebody else, like say a, a Kanye West, said, oh, I like that, samples it. So now your, your income stream that you had from a hit from 1992 is earning now, and it is the, the most lucrative thing on your royalty statement. I like that. Let's um, talk a little bit about how we get into music or having our music published. If I'm an up and coming artist, let's say I put an EP out or whatever, and I'm just trying to um, establish my, this crackling is making my skin itch. <laughs> I don't like it. Um, yeah, if I'm an up and coming artist, If you're creating music anyway, I would always suggest you join a PRO. In the UK, it's the PRS. And you register your records because you just don't know where your song will be played. You don't have to be published to earn money from a sound recording on, on neighbouring rights or on the PRO side, which is the composition side. And I think a lot of people think you have to be an artist to earn money from writing records. No, you don't. You could be the creative behind 
the artists, because a lot of artists are performing rights organization. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I always say to people, if you've got music out there, you should become a member of the PRS and learn to do great housekeeping. Because if you don't register your records, you'll be surprised how many successful writers don't register records and they're not going to earn any money. And if your publisher doesn't know that you've been in the studio with, I don't know, say the, the next big rapper is Footy 2, and no one knows you were in that session, and your publisher only finds out after the record's done 20 million streams, somebody else has been earning money from that. And then we get into disputes with that. I think we're going to get into that later on. So publishers will come looking for you if you're having a big hit. Small, you know, independent publishers, major publishers, as soon as you start to have hits, they'll come looking for you. And they usually want the main person, the person who had the lion's share on the record. And, they don't, and then maybe they'll invest in you if they can hear there's a catalogue of music that you have. So you could have one big hit and they listen to the rest of your music and then they'll say, oh, you know what, we think you could be worth this if they, get in, if they want to A&R you and develop you. Some just want you because you're the big thing that year. And as a music manager, I've seen that. And I've looked after people who I've done crazy deals for. And looked after people who've done, I've done smaller deals for, but have gone on to have very successful careers. So, yeah. What was the question? Was it, how did, Yeah, what how, if I'm an, an up-and-coming artist, artist, yeah, what steps do I need to take to event, essentially get my music published? Okay. Um, that would be getting signed, wouldn't it, as well? So, <laughs> it would be getting noticed. Um... There's lots of different ways to get noticed as an artist, but I think obviously social media now is like such a huge one. And I think a lot of labels and a lot of publishers are catching up with it because, you know, I wasn't in the mu music industry at this point, but 10 years ago it was a lot of like going to gigs and doing a lot of live and all of that. And now it's like something goes viral. We don't, we can't always predict it. It like we find it at the same time that the fans find it. And then you know, there's a bit of a bidding war maybe. And, you know, so I think that happens a lot. And I was speaking to like a label person the other day and it, they were saying about how, you know, you find something and it's viral, everybody already knows about it. And then you have to do some like public artist development, which kind of everybody hates because, you know, you're working out what the artist is like, what their, you know, what their brand is, like who they are, what they want to write about, their sound. Um, but I think, yeah, so social media is like a huge one because that's how people are being found at the moment. Like that's how, you know, fans are finding new music and a lot of like young adults and everything are just kind of streaming and streaming and streaming things and playing videos, playing TikToks over and over and over again. And that is one of the ways that we're finding new stuff at the moment. Um, another way I'd say is like, maybe this is more unconventional, but get yourself a manager, <laughs> get yourself a good manager that is on the same page as you, that believes in you, that might have, you know, connections in the industry already. Um, same with a lawyer, because we find out about new music, new artists, that way as well. So that's another step, I'd say. You want to add anything, Dan? Um, yeah, I'd say, like Susie said, put yourself out there, particularly if you're an artist. Be, as an artist, your job is to be vulnerable which is a very difficult thing in the first place, but putting yourself out there to be vulnerable to people who would like you, to people who wouldn't like you, to people who really like you but have to pretend they don't like you. Um, and you have to put yourself out there to be discovered. Even if you were a mechanic, even mechanics have Instagram pages now. Um, so like, you have to put yourself out there. It's the new way of marketing yourself. You can't rely on the fact that I'm the big guy in college, I'm the big guy in the ends. Um, you have to put yourself out there to be discovered. Um, and once you grow that, it puts you even in a bigger, in a better position. Put yourself in a position where you're not begging to be signed, where people are begging to sign you. Because you've grown a fan base, you know your audience, you know what your music is like. And I think that's a very, very important thing to, to do. That way you don't end up five years later wishing, oh, I wish I never did that deal, I wish I never did that. Because you've built your mini empire. And like we have this saying that phrase differently, where... You're having a house party, right? Anyone coming to your party should bring a bottle, right? Who, what are they bringing? You should think about it. Cool, I'm having a party. I'm building. I'm making my house nice. What do I want people to add value to me? People can't add value to something that's non-existent. 
So you have to build your own value. And I guarantee you, once you do that, the all the pieces of the puzzle start to fit in. So you, you had asked if you're an up and coming artist. So the first step, as as I Jacqueline was saying, is you need to be in the system. So if you like when I was when I was studying, I used to have a, a part time job, I used to work in supermarkets and that. So when you go to work in the in, in Sainsbury's, you know there are other supermarkets available. But when I was working in Sainsbury's the way that Sainsbury's know who they're paying and how they're going to pay my tax is that I have a national insurance number. If you are an artist and you've had a couple of um, releases and or you've had some music, even if you've had it on YouTube, so it's not officially released, but it's being streamed on YouTube, so it's not a release, but it's earning because somebody's paying to be able to view your, your, your intellectual copyright. So... If you've got some music like that, you're already in the system. You're contributing to the system. Somebody has to pay a license for that music to be up on YouTube. And every time that somebody has to pay money, that is when publishing comes into effect. Because somebody has to get paid, and it should be you. You can't get paid if you're not in the system. So as Jacqueline said, the first port of call is your performing rights organization in England. That is the PRS, the Performing Rights Society, or PRS for Music, because, oh gosh, I'm going to... There, there, there were two there, sides. There. <laughs> there were two sides, but they joined together, and they're now PRS for Music. So in order for you to get your equivalent of a national insurance number, which is called a CAE, Composer, Author, Editor, CAE, Editor being French, for Publisher, for you to get a CAE number, you have to join a society. In England, we have one. That's the PRS. You can join a, a society anywhere in the world, but they don't like that. However, if, for instance, like one of our clients was part of a, of a, a group that was based in Germany, if a lot of your airplay is coming in Germany, it makes sense to join the Gamer, which is the, the, the German society. If it's in France, then you might want to join... <laughs> Oh, is that what we're doing now? Is that what we're doing now? Oh, 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 oh. Don't, don't, don't do it now. <laughs> but wherever your the most of your um your your income is coming from, that's where you should join the the society. But you live in England, it's easier to just join the PRS. That's the first port of call before you get to the looking for a publisher and what have you, what have you. The first port of call, join the performing rights organisation. You're in the system. Even if you haven't registered your songs, some of your royalties will, will, will come into your account. Some, not all, because we don't live in an ideal world. If we did, you just register, everything Chris. But we don't, so it doesn't happen that way, and that's why you have to holler at your boy. Or your, or your uncle. <laughs> and so, first of all, I think that people should understand that being in the system means that the moment that you put something up on your social medias, it's actually released. But too often we don't understand that because the music industry or the ecosystem has changed, the moment you put something on your platform, on your Instagram, on your YouTube, it's actually released in the public domain, which means actually it's potentially going to generate value, therefore generate money. Um, and each one of these platforms is in the business of selling something to somebody and your content is the reason why people go there, then they sell stuff to you. So you're generating value for other people, which is one of the things that's wrong with the ecosystem, if you like. Um, so for me, the first thing you should be, be aware of is that your philosophy should be don't leave money on the table. And that's what we're doing too much with music. So we should first of all understand that the moment you release something, it's in the system. Therefore, the system should actually have a way of people being able to register that works immediately, Absolutely. that it's on a platform, so that there is no gap. And there's no reason why we shouldn't or can't do that, because CAE 
ISRWC and blockchain technology means that it's absolutely possible. We're in a digitized world. But the other thing that we need to really be aware of as practitioners, as music people, music creators, is that those platforms are your way or your window to the world. And the way in which you use those platforms will be the conduit for you to creating a higher level of perceived value. And a really good example of that right now is if uh, most probably people already know Happy Music. Yeah? Happy Music is a good, idea, a good example of somebody understanding the platform and creating value by continuing to put out content that is, one, good, and more importantly, two, shareable. And once you m create content on that level, you're creating you're generating value, therefore, you're potentially generating money. So you, those are really important considerations for me in terms of how you utilize um, the social media platforms and whether or not and when you should be registering your work. You've said everything. But I will add, um, it's really about the level of consistency as well when it comes to your marketing and in terms of the whole social media aspect that Uncle Adi was talking about. So once you release a song, don't think, oh, in six months, I'm not gonna keep talking about it. You continue talking about that song because then it's always about adding that value as expressed and finding more people to listen to the music, which equals more streams, which then equals more royalties and et cetera. Okay, great. Love that background noise, whatever that was. Um, I want to talk about some of the myths. We did touch on it a bit earlier, but I know some people get into the industry and they're like, okay, I want to get deal or I want to do this and I'm going to make money. And, you know, we spoke about um, if you want to get into publishing, like it's something for your, your grandkids. It's more generational wealth. But what are some of the misconceptions about getting a publishing deal or working in the world of music publishing that people have got completely wrong and should change the perspective on? Anything anyone's heard? If not, then we can move on. Um, that everyone deserves a like, big deal, that like, everyone signed the big deal, or that like, everyone who works in music is rich. I think that, but, I, well, I don't know. That, that's a conception I get from everyone in regards to like, oh my God, you work in music, you must like, everyone must be like so famous. <laughs> but you've got to realize it's just, it's just everyday people. It's the same, yeah. Every, someone in this room, you're gonna, in like three years, you're gonna see, oh, I remember knowing that person. They're just, they're still Dave who you went to the pub with. Um, everyone's just normal people who just have to put themselves and be vulnerable every day. Um, I'll say that's probably the misconception. And he, particularly for artists, thinking that, ah, oh, because this person's not paying me a hundred grand, it must mean they're trying to bump me. Mm. Whereas it could just be, no, you're not worth a hundred grand. However, if you, like a, a great a great piece of business, I remember reading was Beyonce not getting paid her fee or only getting like 20% of her usual fee for doing the music for Lion King, whereas she chose to just take the royalties instead, mm -hmm. which is not normal right but from that she's now she's going to be earning money forever and ever instead of just getting the fee for doing the soundtrack um and for some artists some artists have probably been in that position where they've been offered similar things and they're like oh nah they're trying to pump me why are they only giving me that whereas she had the vision to realize that okay great i take a loss here but i win real big in about five, 10 years time, if this does extremely well. Um, and that's, like I said, think of, instead of thinking of being rich for today, think about being rich forever. In my experience, the biggest misconception, especially when I go to Jamaica, is that publishers, every one of them are turf. <laughs> Everyone is a turf. That's the first thing that a lot of people say about especially publishers. Now, what has happened over the years is that people have signed bad deals. The, the, the traditional model of, of publishing meant that it's like when you're, when you're going into a negotiation, you're, you're speaking to a, a young person who the Lord has given a talent. All of a sudden, they're trying to make money from this talent. So they come, they come to get this, this deal. And then somebody gives them bad advice. They sign a deal. 
So the bad deal that they signed whenever now tarnishes every other deal and it tarnishes everybody in the industry. So they're like Keisha said about her, her father's catalog. That generation, that's all the all the publishers came, came to Jamaica, signed up everybody, and then most of those artists never heard from those companies again. So that is one of the biggest misconceptions of our industry that everybody is trying to con you. But uh, uh, what I always say is a contract is not something you should be scared of, but it is definitely something you should respect. It only becomes a bad contract if you do not read and understand. If you don't understand, don't be afraid to say, look, what does this paragraph mean? If, you're, if you have a lawyer and your lawyer is advising you and you still don't understand it, you better make sure that you understand it by the time you leave because he's still charging you. Mm -hmm. Even if he sends an email on your behalf, your lawyer is charging you for that email. So know what you're signing. Know who you're signing to. Then, fortunately or unfortunately, as the case may be, you will not have signed a bad deal because you understood it. It's the understanding that that leads to you signing a good deal or at least a fair deal. Let's jump on that. What makes a good publishing deal and what exactly is negotiable um, as a talent? I don't know, we're going to be here all day. <laughs> what makes a good deal? A good deal to me is always when both parties are giving up something and gaining things that they want. A great deal is where somebody is getting everything they want and somebody else isn't. So. I always say whenever you're doing business, you should be doing good business regardless, right? I think as well, it depends what you need the deal, what you need the money for. What do you need the deal for? Often when people say to me, oh, I'm looking for a publishing deal, I'm looking for this, I'm like, so why do you need the deal? If you're already generating income and you've, you've already got your ecosystem that's helping you to generate an income, do you really need the publishing deal or do you need an admin deal? What do you want the deal for? And no one can tell you what you want that deal for. And I think a lot of people get lost because somebody's in your ears telling you, oh, well, that man got 150 bags. You don't know what that guy gave up for 150 bags. And I often say to people, a lot of deals are lost in the pub, lost in a group chat, because people, they, they give you the cherry. They don't give you the, the ice cream and the, the, the base of the, um, the dessert. They're just like telling you about this cherry. You know, that guy that got 150K, maybe did a 30-70 split with five options. Mm. Where somebody else comes in, does a deal at 60K, no options, you know. When the deal's done, the deal is done. Who's gonna be better off if the company's helped you to build and you go on and do this fabulous stuff because everyone thinks they're brilliant at making music, right? So when they make music, you know, because your family and friends tell you, oh, you're amazing, whether you're amazing or not. So, you know, you gotta know what do you want the deal for? What, what's a bad deal to me may be a great deal for you because of where you are in your life. Mm. And That's what's very a great important. deal for me, I, I could turn around and say, I want a three quarters of a million, but what do I want it for? Am I going to get it to go and hire people, to come and do what my publisher may, not, may or may not be doing? Am I signing to a major? Am I signing to an independent who I'm one of one and I'm going to be very important to them because they're p &L, they need to make sure I work. So it's all about what's important to you. And only you really know that, so you should never let anyone get in your ear. That's what I, uh, that's what I always say to creatives. Casey, I want to talk to you a little bit about this, um, because I know you're, you're a founder of your own company. Um, what, in, in some circumstances, could you tell us what are things that um, talent should be looking out for, um, and essentially what makes a good deal for them? I think, firstly, we need to kind of step back a bit and understand there's various types of publishing mm -hmm. deals that you can have. So like Jacqueline touched on that, you can either have an admin or you can go to the, the full publishing, um, whereas way back it was like they would take 100% at some point. <laughs> um, so it's really, I think, to understand that there's options in terms of types of deals that you can go for. So let's say you're just starting out and it's more, you don't even understand how to register your music on PRS and you're just getting into this whole couple of, oh, I've put 100% it should. Sometimes you can go straight to an administrator, such as 
Cody, Cody can do that. Um, but then, but then, but then you've all. <laughs> Then you've also got the other options where you might have heard of Song Trusts, Centric, TuneCore, those type of companies that also do admin arrangements where it's literally they offer a service and they take a percentage of the royalties that's earned. Um, and I think some also offer sync arrangements. It's, it's varying things on their websites. But then in terms of what Jacqueline was talking about, it's more like that the deal, the publishing deal um, that you can have with a lot of the majors offer that kind of service in terms of where it's, you can get your advance and all those type of arrangements. So it's more really what you and where you're at in your music career as well. It's understanding that level of, I think everyone wants the, the millions. They'll, they'll go up to YouTube, oh, I've got a million streams, why haven't I got a million pounds? And it's not understanding the, the business itself. So I think it's really feeling and, and, and understanding your career aspects and where you are. So like Jacqueline was saying, it's, it's more, you can't just say you want 250 because you feel like you need it today. <laughs> no, it's more where are you in your career and what deal best suits where you're at. So I think, uh, so one of the things, most important things that I've learned about the industry is identifying the different types in the industry, whether it be in management, publishing, recording artists, etc., etc. There are three types that I identify. The inactive, the reactive, and the proactive. And if you have to identify the type of publisher is going to get you to the bag in the long run. And that's the proactive. The inactive is just going to sit down and wait and administer. The reactive is going to wait until you've got success and administer. And the proactive is going to go out there and have a eat what you kill mentality every day working on your behalf. And that's the kind of publisher that will be useful to you. So if you're looking, publisher, manager, whatever it is, inactive, reactive, proactive, identify and move. That's a very important point. Did you want to jump on? Okay, cool. I want to talk about the different types of royalties. Um, so what's the difference between mechanical royalties, performing royalties, and sync licensing royalties? My, 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 you were offered. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The way publishing works is it's all on licenses. So the, the, the three things that you mentioned there are three different types of licenses. Now, a license is basically that it is a permission to use something. So if it's a performance license, that will be paid by a broadcaster. So your broadcaster, that's your TV station, your radio station, and now your, your um, internet service provider. They will pay that broadcast license. So... When you go on, on Spotify, say, and you press play, and you stream a piece of music, that is, a, is now seen as a broadcast. If, however, you go on Spotify, you hear the song, and you like the song, and you're like, oh, I'm going to spend that 99 pence. Now you've downloaded that recording, so now it permanently belongs to you, like when some of us started in this industry, we would go and buy a record because we, we liked that. that, <laughs> that. Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> What's the record? Well, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> sorry, sorry. So, when you were, like, so, so we used to call them record players. Apparently, they're called vinyl players now. So when we used to buy a piece of vinyl, because that was the only way that you could hear the song that you loved, all day, every day, you had to capture that piece of music. So now when you capture that piece of music, it's an actual download, it's a sale. So now there's a mechanical element. Now, mechanical because you've mechanized somebody else's intellectual property. So you've fed it through a process so that it can be sold to, to other people. So back in the day, it would have been a vinyl, it would have been CD or even cassette tape. Now I'm really going there, innit? So, but now it's a, it's a download. So the me there's a mechanical license because you've made it available for others to purchase. Now, a synchronization license now is when you have a piece of music and you know like you're watching, say, a, a kung fu movie and the voice is going one way and the lips are going the other way. What do you say it is? Sub. It's out of? Oh, out of sync. <laughs> because it has not been synchronized properly to 
to the moving lips. So you have to synchronize the music to the moving image. So you do that on TV, video game, film. So anytime you synchronize a piece of music to a piece of film, that is a synchronization. So you have to pay a different license again. Now, that license again is split in two. So now you have the... the I hope you're not taking notes. This is a lot of information, but this is some real gems. <laughs> so you have the... The, the intellectual copyright embodied in that piece of music, but then you also have something called the master rights. Back in the day, we used to call it the ma who owned the master tape, because when you were coming out of the studio, you'd leave with a physical tape. Now, you leave with a master right, because you're not leaving with anything physical. So it's he who owns, or she who owns, or they who owns the master right. So for a synchronization, you pay for the master right as well as the, the intellectual copyright. So there are two elements of the, of the synchronization license. So in a, in a nutshell, that's the, the, the difference between the three. Okay, did everyone get that? Well, you can watch this back later. We'll put this on YouTube so you can watch this back. Um, okay, I wanna chat to you, Susie, and we're gonna get into like the intersections of music publishing. So you are an international A and R, the work you, you work with a variety of talents. Um, do you find that uh gender or race um can affect um the success of anyone because getting a publishing deal? So do you find it's easier for women to get music publishing deals? Is there still stereotypes that you find on your end that still exists that might influence um, the success of someone getting a deal? Um, I wouldn't say so as much anymore. I can't speak to what it was like 10 years ago. I definitely think in the music industry there are people who, you know, aren't honouring, you know, um, diversity and all of that kind of thing. But um, I'd say if we're looking at the people that we're signing, everyone has equal opportunity to get a publishing deal. We're just going for like, is the music really, really good? Are the songs really, really good? I'm not sometimes going like, how talented are they? Like that's more of like a label side of thing. I'm looking, I'm listening to the song. And so whether you're female, male, like anything, I'm listening to the song. I'm not looking necessarily at a person. So I wouldn't necessarily say so. Okay. But I can't speak to the whole music industry. industry yeah, so yeah, I, you sure. know, I'm talking about <laughs> my Water team, Chapel. Yeah. Water Chapel. <laughs> um, Kesia, how about you at Rakodi? Um, how how do you find things um, in the intersections of of a person? Like, are are people looking at your race? Are people looking at whether you're a woman or a man? Do, do you think that influences the success of you gaining a deal or having like public notoriety? Those kind of things. Just to confirm that we're speaking directly about the, the authors and composers and not... Yeah, not you. <laughs> not, not you, um, your brand, but just I, like your experience. Yeah. I um, I would like to say no, but I think that there's still some issues that are continuing throughout and it's, it's going to take a while, even though we've had many changes and lots of allies coming on board and many people really wanting to to be proactive in the space as we've got so many collectives now that are introducing all of the talks on whether it's black people in the industry or um, whether on the business side or the actual creative. So it's there's lots happening and it's very, there's a lot of awareness about it now, whereas it was usually brushed under the, the rug. Um, so I think that is, we're in a good space um, and it's not something to be ignored, but it's, there's definitely still lots of work to be done. Um, and uh, I think we just need to really bond together even more and, and find that kind of... Because even with the, the loads of different societies and, and collectives that are happening, it feels more like segregation again because we've got so many of them. So it's really, we need to create that unity to really step forward and move forward. Okay, cool. Um, let's move on to songwriters and producers. I think we would be quite focused on like the artist out front. So the people who are behind the scenes um, of, of a song, how do they ensure that they are looked after? Because sometimes people can get left out of the conversation. Like you said, like you might be in the room, but you might not end up in the deal. 
how do you, the songwriters and, and everyone involved in the process, make sure that they are okay? Okay, I'll start. Um, I definitely think uh, song splits is a good step as a first point of call. And opening the discussion, being transparent, a lot of people are scared to say, oh, but I had input in that song, or I'm in the room, remember me. So it's very much just being transparent and um, open to say that let's discuss these splits, let's work out what everyone is really deserving of this song. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, except for that the administration of that is really important, the song share agreement. Like, you can download them from many places, your management should have them. You can actually get them on a PRS website right now, right? So um, there is no reason why you're not covered by your um, contribution to a song before you leave the studio. Afterwards, it just becomes a problem. I have horror stories. Trust me, it becomes a problem. So, so just the administration, that's one of the things that creatives don't feel or are not so good at, but it's something that's really important. If you're talking about when you need a manager or something like that, that would be one of the places, but that's just an excuse for not being asked to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So you don't really need, you just need to have that, get that right hand side of your brain working sometimes. Quick question, does everyone understand the difference between like publishing and the recording of a song? Okay, awesome. Um, like um, JPL mentioned earlier, it's very important to get registered in the first place um, because even if you have that conversation, if you're not registered, you're losing the money anyway. So you can have that conversation in the session saying, oh yeah, I'm getting half of that. If the half of that is going to nowhere, it's kind of like saying, ah, oh, JPL's going to give me £50, pounds and she was like, what's your bank account? Oh, I don't have one. And that's, effect that's effectively what your PRS or PRO account is. It's your musical bank account, and, and you need a functioning bank account. Um, and I think that's also super important. And knowing that it's functional, knowing like your IPI number and things like that is very, very important. And I say this a lot when I do talks. Great housekeeping. Your ignorance is on you and your intelligence is on you. And I think if you take 10% of the time, you take looking on social media, who's banging who, who's doing what to who, and you study and you watch videos and you read and listen to audio books, you'll understand about great housekeeping. Your manager can change, your accountant can change, your lawyer can change, you won't change. So you should have a basic understanding of great housekeeping. Your copyright is your copyright. Your intellectual property is yours. You're supposed to take care of it. It's like you wouldn't spend a million doing up a house, right? And just leave the door open, let squatters move in and expect them not to ruin the place. They didn't invest in it. You did. So you're supposed to handle your housekeeping. That is on you. Yes, that's okay. Okay, we've just got a few minutes left. So if you've got any questions, I will come to you and then uh, we can ask that in just a little bit. Um, but aside from publishing, publishing deals, what are some of the other ways that you could advise artists or songwriters, producers to make money outside of working towards getting the deal that they think is going to change their life? First of all, I'd say working towards getting that deal in and of itself is a problem. Because mm. if you know if you now don't get a quote unquote deal, mm. now you're seeing yourself as a failure. Mm. No. I would say work towards having yourself a career. And that whilst you're having a career, you'll be having some yeah. deals. Because traditionally in, in our world, in this in this music game, that's all people focus on. They're like, right, so I'm making this music, yeah. And this is exactly how it goes, you know. Yeah, so, so I'm making this music. And yeah, man, that's on. But, yeah. So now I'm going to take it to a, a record company and I'm going to get a deal. And then I'm going to bust. And then, and then I'm going to be a millionaire. And then I'm going to make, and then I'm going to buy my house. And then I'm going to have all of these, these, excuse me, ladies. I'm going to have all of these girls. And no, the first port of call is whether or not you have the talent 
But we have come to a situation whereby a lot of people who have, um, what should we say, questionable talent are being successful. So now everybody's like, yeah, everybody and his, and his uncle is like, yeah, I could be an artist. So the, 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 the talent element is a lot of the time missing. If you have the talent and the talent can give you a career, you have that career. You will get those deals. But don't be focusing on the quote unquote deal. And then if and when a deal comes, there are two parties. So there's your side and there's my side. So I'm the company. And my best interest is to get as much out of you as possible. Your interest is to get them as much out of me as possible. So I'll go back to your, your, your question about what makes a, a good deal. For me, is what makes it fair. If everybody is happy. Like, like Ade was saying, you come out of the studio and you've all contributed on a song. And then when you, get the, when you go to register your song, invariably what happens is, say there were six people recording that, that track. One person invariably goes and registers more than everybody else. But if at the point of recording, you all had an understanding, that shouldn't happen. So it's about understanding at that point of creation. That is the point that publishing gets involved. Remember there was that um, cartoon, um, Roadrunner. Remember, anybody? You are not that young, stop Road it. Roadrunner? <laughs> what do you mean um, on like Cartoon Network? So, 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 Roadrunner <laughs> and, and the coyote. When the coyote okay, has, yeah, has, has, a, has, a, has, a, has an idea, yeah, yeah, and, and it's like, Mimi, and yes. you get a ping, <laughs> you get this idea, the ping, at the point of the ping moment, if you're involved at the point of that ping moment, you're involved in the creation of the copyright, the original copyright, because it's an idea. It's the when you turn that idea into a recording, now it becomes exactly that, a recording. But when you're in the studio together, or even if you're doing it on, say, a Zoom, or you're doing it over the phone or whatever, it's that ping moment. So if, say, you, let's take you, you five here, you guys collaborate on a, on a recording, especially in this post-COVID time where you can do it over Zoom or over the phone or whatever. So the five of you make a recording. And Mr. Liver <coughs> is, <laughs> is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the engineer. So you take that recording, and then you go and add uh, a guitarist to that recording. The guitarist is only added to an already existing copyright, especially if he's only playing alongside what you've already created. So the guitarist is not automatically entitled to a piece of your publishing. You guys are. If you decide that, oh, okay, we're going to break him off a piece, that's up to you. If, however, when that guitarist comes in, he makes a deal. Oh, actually, it's a story I heard earlier. <laughs> he makes a deal with you, Mr. Engineer, <laughs> that he's coming to play the guitar, and so you have to break him off a piece. You haven't, broke, you haven't given it to the rest of these guys. Guitarist believes he's getting a piece. You understand that. <laughs> yeah, he may have written he may have written his 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 guitar riff himself and he knows that okay so i've given you this guitar riff go do with it what you will but you haven't confirmed that you haven't told these guys that's where your problem comes and mr guitarist is now going to sue you you and your liverpool shirt <laughs> And everybody else involved, and they had nothing to do with it. It's all about understanding. Understanding. But on the president, would you, wouldn't you say it's a good thing when they finish the, the, the initial, initial composition to just send an email to each other and say we're doing a straight five-way split or whatever the splits are going to be and agree that there and then before even managers, publishers, whoever get involved? Because mm -hmm. you guys were in the room. We weren't in the room. We take what you give us. I think that's a nice way to end it there. Okay, one last point, last point. Stop putting my business out there. <laughs> that's not what I wanted to say. 
So <laughs> as far as the idea of your value is concerned, it's really important to understand for me one, one, one more thing. Every record company, every publishing company, in fact, every business you can ever think of, if they're successful, they work on the basis of a product portfolio, which is yesterday's, today's, and tomorrow's breadwinners. Every one of you who is a practitioner should consider yourself to be a business. And as a business, you have three parts of you. The person, like Ade, the, um, the creative side, Ade the artist, and the actual business, who is actually the part in the middle, Ade Incorporated. And each one of you is that. If you're putting out music, you're that. Which means you should also understand the discipline of the yesterday's, today's, and tomorrow's breadwinner. And as a creative, you can't afford to put everything into your music and not take care of the personal self. So when it comes to doing your creative work, try to make sure that you have some kind of income that is maintaining you. That way, you don't have to do the stupid record deals or the stupid publishing deals. That's a great way to end it. Thank you very much. Make a round of applause for our panelists, everybody. Okay. I think we had some very, very key takeaways there, but now is your chance to ask some direct questions to our panelists. Kesia has got to step off. Yeah, you've got to leave us. Say goodbye, girl. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, if I have to leave, but if you want to ask me any questions, you can get me on Instagram. Um, I'll probably put out my email somewhere, so it's Kesia Ellis anywhere. <laughs> so you'll find me. Yeah, we'll make sure that you can find her. Um, so if you've got any questions, could you just line up to this side? Um, Daniela is going to have the microphone. Yes, our first guest, right on up. I love that. <laughs> what's your name and what's your question? Hi, guys. My name is Jade Loren. I'm an artist manager for Denaro X20. He's going to perform later. He's great. My question is in two parts. My first question is, it's kind of simple, but it's not. And it's, how do you know your music's being played? So, obviously, how does a publishing company know that it's being played on a radio or on a football stadium, in a football stadium in Qatar or wherever, like, how, how do you know? And then the second part of my question is for Uncle Ade. You spoke about um, the proactive publishing companies. Can you name drop a few, please, so <laughs> <laughs> we can sign up? Thank you. I'll, I'll take the first part of the question. Uh, sorry, the second part of the question. The only one that I'll vouch for as a proactive, really proactive right now is hypnosis. Yeah, they have a very different type of model, and, and I'm all about that type of model. But it'd be really hard for you to get in publishing till with. Okay, and whoever wants to answer, how do you know that your music is being played? That should be a PRS question. But they, they ask the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in an ideal world, in an ideal world, it's all automated. There are systems that that track the radio stations, the, the TV broadcasts, but we don't live in an ideal world. So it, the, the, the technology is there, but it's not always being utilized. So you can't know exactly where your music is being played. But what the, the systems that we, we do have that have been working to an extent is that when the radio station plays their, their music, they then put their log sheets in with their local society. And then the local society then gets a breakdown of what's been played from what they receive. However, with the, with the BBC stations, so with, with most um, national stations, they, play, they pay on everything that they play. So with the BBC, everything that gets played gets notified. With the independent radio stations, they, they, so they, the PRS would come in something like, two days of a month. And I'm breaking down the tin. I'm breaking down the tin. I gave you the tin. You, you see, small girl, I gave you the tin. You wouldn't take the tin. So now I'm doing the tin, and you are interrupting the tin. <laughs> so what happens is they take a sample of your playlist, and then they pay out against the sample. So you could have a, a track that was playing on, say, Kiss FM for the whole month. But if it doesn't fall into that sample, then you wouldn't get paid. Why are you putting my papers out there? <laughs> I'll just say it. So, yeah, 
there, there's no real way to know exactly what's been played except from from those locks. But, but, okay, cool. but also, there's like a common misconception that uh, pe radio DJs just play song at random. Like radio, like particularly major radio stations like the One Extras or Radio One, they have a playlist, and it's a public playlist. You can just Google it. Radio One playlist, and they have like an A list, B list, C list, and these are songs that will be on rotation. That's why it's because most people, mo I find most people under 30 don't really listen to radio. But if you do, you realize I guarantee you just switch on the radio randomly, then switch the radio again on like two hours later, you're probably hearing the exact same songs yeah. because there's a playlist which helps them keep track of what they play. Now there will be the odd song at random, which is like the request shows and things like that. And that's an easy way to know what songs are being played. And also, Mr. President spoke about the licenses to request songs. If, if prior to that, you would know because they'd requested the license to do so, if it's not on a playlist. Um, yeah. Thank you. Next question, please. What's your name? What's your question? Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for all um, talking today. It was great. Um, my name's Kells. And I'm is that working? I'm a product manager at a group of record labels, and um, my question is: What do you think? What skills, experience, and contacts do you think make a good music publisher? And if you wanted to transition from the label side, how would you advise doing that? And I just like question following on from that last question is: You were talking about that pool of independent radio stations. If you hear a track being played out on Ticket or Rinse or NTS or whatever it is, uh, how do you chase up getting paid? If if it's in that sample playlist that you were chatting about. Sorry, that was a loads of questions. I'll take the second half because I've actually had experience of it. Um, I had a track that was played on Kiss FM when Kiss FM was sampled one in every 90 days. And that song was on the A-list and it was played every hour. And I'd be on a building site up to my knees in mud, walk past the radio and my song would play. I'd get into the to the lorry at the end of the day, turn on the radio, like you said, my song would play. Because it wasn't on the list of the sample tracks on that one day, there was nothing I could do about it. I didn't get, it didn't generate any royalties. And like an, like an idiot, I'm like looking for my money. So I actually called up Lindsay Wesker. And I was like, Lindsay, how can I get my money? And he, basically his answer was, um, it's not something that you should be concerning yourself with. It's something that a manager should just do. But there's actually nothing I can do about it at that point. So the sample problem is a big problem with the way that collective societies work now. And there is absolutely no reason why that should be the case. Let me just wrap that one up real quick. So with the, with the kisses and the... the, the what are they called again? Capital Extras and, and, and those guys. That's, that is the problem. However, if you can prove that you were played, especially on a BBC station, you can write to the PRS and get some remuneration. So there are ways around it, but if you don't fall into the sample, you've basically fallen through the cracks. Even when you, you are registered or, or you're you are registered, but your copyright isn't registered properly. When it gets played on the BBC, as far as they're concerned, sorry to say, your song doesn't exist. Either, I know it's, it's a horrible one. It's one that I've been fighting for years. But either for neighboring rights or for publishing, as far as they're concerned, your, your, your song doesn't exist. You have about 18 months, between 18 months and three years, to go back and do a back claim and claim that money, but it's a very finite window. So if you're sitting there two years later, you're like, hold on a minute, how comes I had this hit and I didn't get paid? It's probably too late already. Yeah. So what was, the, what was the first part? And I was also going to say the reason why the um, the samples are done in the way that they're done is simply because it's about how much the license holders pay into the system. The BBC pays into the system a lot more. So that's why we pay out, we ge it generates more income for the creatives. Whereas Global, I think their sample now has gone up, which owns KISS, 
choice. Capital, uh, capital extra now. Sorry, it was choice before, wasn't it? So there, I'm showing my age. <laughs> and um, so that's what the problem is. It's just about how much each licensee pays into the system. That's really what it's about. And also as well, like internationally, if your songs aren't registered correctly, in certain different territories, you cannot go back more than a year. The PRS can't do anything about it. You just cannot go back because you didn't do good housekeeping. So it comes back again to housekeeping, housekeeping, housekeeping. Okay, the first part of the question, I think Susie might be able to answer that. It was um, how to get, well, was it different job roles? Because yeah. you're a label. Yeah, can label into publishing. Oh, um, well, I did it because I was already in war the Warner like, family. So I kind of made my HR team aware that I would didn't want to stay in royalties, basically, for like too long, because I was like, I don't want to be doing this. Um, so I think I, I just had a meeting with them and I said, I want to be doing something more creative. But apart from that, you know, it wasn't just saying that and then just walking away and then hoping something happened. I kind of just went out. I met as many people as I could. I took meetings within the label. I took advice wherever I could get it. And I kind of just went to everything. I was like a massive yes person. So I think that like just connecting with people, you know, not being like likable, but actually kind of being likable in a way because nobody's going to hire you onto their team if they're like, Oh, yeah. I can't see how you'd fit here. Like, I think just being open and up for everything, not everything, but like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I think that's helpful. Yeah. So, I think you've got to love songs as well. There's yeah. so many people who don't love music, who work in the music business, they don't like it. So, a little bit of diving real quick. So, do you do any of the accounting for your, for your record company? No, I do like the product management. So you do the product management? Yeah. So your with your product management, so what are you, where where what does that mean? It's basically well, it means you're working on promotion like radio, clubs, DJs, mm -hmm. etc. Artworking um, and like the artist proposition. Okay. For, for, for on a release basis. The reason I'm asking is because a lot of publishers come into the business like with um, Keisha's former boss. She was an accountant. So accounting is, is, a, is a big part of it. Um, the a and r in is a different mm -hmm. part of it. The, the product is a different part of it. So are you someone who could just be in the office, you one, just reading lines and 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 numbers and numbers and numbers and lines and lines and names? Are you that kind of person? If you say no, you ain't not going to be no good publisher, homie. Because what you have to understand is, in publishing, you're, you're listening to a piece of music and you're like, yeah, man, every time I hear this tune, I just go crazy because this is my, this is my jam. This is... As a publisher, that recording is nothing but a collection of words. That collection of words is attached to a collection of numbers. Those numbers are connected to lines on a statement. Until those lines on the statement start to be, start to look like um, AAA music seminars, dot, 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 15 pounds, and then the next one is 20 pounds, 35 grand. You're, you're just a collection of words. So unless you can, you can, if you can mine that, because it sounds mind numbing, doesn't it? But this is what we do. That's what you do on the cold face of it. When, when you're getting the big check and all that, that's, that's way down the line. The, the, the cold face is basically going through lists, making sure that the song is registered in England, in Germany, in France, in Japan, somebody else says, oh, you've registered it wrong. You should only have 20%. Now you have to become a mathematician. Yeah, it's, it's like that. It's a lot. Okay, we've got to move on to the next question. We've got to have a one more question um, before we move on to our next performance. 
Hello, what's your name? What's your question? Hi. Um, first of all, thank you. Like this discussion has been amazing. I've taken many gems. Um, I'm Aldia. I'm a singer, songwriter, and presenter, and I'm currently studying music production and sound engineering. Um, my current question is to do working with people from different countries. So if working with another artist or producer from another country, is there anything that needs to be thought about in regards to music publishing and different PROs? Okay, so one thing I know about working in Germany is that they have a different way of identifying the splits. So in Germany, you have 33% um, for the music, 33% for the lyrics, 33% for the top line. Whereas in the UK, it's split 50-50. So that would be something to consider. What's top line, sorry? Melody. Top, the melody, sorry, my bad. Um, I'd say if you're looking after someone from a different country, understanding the, the local market of that person. If you're trying to manage an artist in that space, understand what they're trying to do, understand what relevance that they have in that market. Um, on the business side, like Uncle Ade have said, understanding the different, it's kind of like the laws in England is different from the laws in France. The, in, in America, it's illegal to cross the road with, on a red light. Over here, we just do it and we do it. It's the, it's the same in business, it's the same in music, understanding the legal ramifications of certain things and the procedures, and it's very important. Like, it goes back to, again, housekeeping. Make it quick, please. <laughs> I shall try. So, so to, to lead on from, from Ade now, um, the, the, the writer splits. So like you said, we have, in England, we do 50-50. So it's a, an invisible line, the lyrics and melody. That's the top line. And then the music, 50%. In reggae, it's your artist and producer. In hip-hop, it would be your, your artist, your beat maker, and whatever samples <laughs> were in there, and everything gets split. In England, like I said, it's 50-50. In America, they speak in 200s. So they have a hundred for the for the um, artist and a, a, sorry a hundred for that top line and a hundred for the music. So they speak in two hundreds. So when you're dealing with Americans, sometimes they give you splits and you're like, but this don't make sense. But this is what it is. They deal in hundred hundreds. And we deal in fifty fifty. To cook your noodle even more, when um, you had PRS and you had MCPS, <laughs> sorry. They used to, PRS used to deal in percentages and MCPS, or is it the other way around, used to deal in fractions. So you'd have 100% here and then you'd have three twelves or, or six twelves on the other side. It was, it was mad. But now it's, it's more uniform whereby we deal in percentages. So if you deal in that 50-50, it makes it easier. But know that when you're dealing with an American, it's going to be 100-100. So if they're a member of ASCAP or BMI, then it's going to be, they're going to be talking in hundreds as opposed to us talking in 50-50s. Okay, cool. Lastly, give us your name, your social media, or how people can contact you. Let's start with, with you. Um, so my name is Jacqueline Pelham Lee. I'm known as JPL in the business. And I, my Instagram is I am Ms. JPL. And that's how you can get hold of me. My name is Susie Woodbridge, and my Instagram is Susie Woodbridge. I was actually <laughs> really lucky to get my full name. And it's spelled up there. So. Okay, so I'm Kennedy Mensa. The company is Back to the Future Music Limited. And the Back to the Future, not like, your, not like the movie. Back, the number two, Delta Alpha F Music, B to the F Music on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, Facebook, Back to the Future Music Limited, or the personal Insta is Prezi B2F, B R E double Z Y B, the number two. Oh, but you don't look at you. Are, we are writing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Prezi B number two F for future. Cool. Um, my name is Dan Edu, um, or search phrase differently. I'm sure you find me somewhere or no Wahala living, as I'm the very... Wahala means stress in Nigerian, and I'm a very stressy person, so everyone who knows me, I'm, I'm so laid back, I'm a horizontal. 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's Dan Edu, Noah Harley Living, or phrased differently. Uncle Ade, um, two two um, accounts: The Voice Coach UK and UMBA Global. Fantastic! Round of applause for our panelists, everybody.